So around 1939, I started to make smaller models with five foot rotors driven by an Electrolux motor taken from a vacuum cleaner with a transmission. You see the gears in the transmission? Into that gear, there's a ring gear there and a sun, sun in the middle and the ring gear on the outside. These are the planetary gears. They fit. Do you see that? Yeah. Now, this is, this is actually the second stage. There are two stages. If I take this one out, that's the first stage, so that it makes a 10 to 1 reduction, or 13 to 1 in this case, driving the rotor from the high-speed shaft and coming up through the center of the shaft, a little shaft from the motor itself drives the flywheel separate. That flywheel maintains an artificial horizon and controls the blade, which is in this hub, which I'm now pointing to. Now those blades are feathered by the flywheel, which is up here and spins at a much higher speed and holds it uh, stable. You can even rock the fuselage and the thing will just stand still in the air. What the hell was that, Hunley? That's crazy. I, I love, though, he's using a vacuum cleaner motor yeah. to create a helicopter. Right. Well, that was Arthur Young, the designer of the Bell helicopter. Um, it's funny because we did Henry Ford. He, this guy's the Henry Ford of helicopters, Hunley. This is, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, not that he did mass production, but this was his thing like the car was to Henry Ford, the, the, the helicopter was to Arthur Young. Yeah, it seems like a, I mean, really charming guy. And you look at the commentary on the video, I, I guess that took, I think that video's from the 80s or 90s, somewhere in there? Uh, I, that I don't know. But the, the, the reality of it is he was a philosopher inventor. There's a lot of these guys who are philosopher inventors, you know what I mean, who... Uh, he had seances with his wife and trying to bring back the dead, but he was a complete mathematical engineer, science brain, who later, uh, later in life when he retired, um, had like an entire wing at Stanford about consciousness raising and philosophical, philosophical ideas uh, regarding consciousness. So, so he's the hippie Jack Parsons. In a way, I mean, Jack Parsons <laughs> was kind of a hippie anyway. I mean, but they all end up in Northern California which is I'm now declaring a separate nation state where the right. CIA puts people, the tech people are up there. It's a separate country, not, not to be confused with Southern California, Northern California, the Northwest should be a separate nation at this point. Yeah. And they keep traveling North to the people's Republic of uh, Oregon. Yeah, if you keep going the people's Republic of Oregon. And eventually if you go far enough, you're going to hit China, you know, which uh, I predict they'll be coming down the five sometime soon with the uh, Chinese tanks, but that's a su subject for another day. <laughs> I have no doubt. Right. Well, yeah, Arthur Lyman, Arthur Lyman, Arthur Young uh, is the stepfather of Michael Payne. And we're going to get into Michael Payne's family because nobody, and I mean nobody, is more deep state as a representative, in my humble opinion, than Michael Payne. And, and I don't want to talk about Ruth Payne today. This is all Michael Payne's day. He's got his own day and he deserves his own day. This may be a two-part day for Michael Payne, but Michael Payne deserves it. I don't want to get into Ruth. We covered Ruth a lot. Max Good's documentary uh, is linked probably somewhere around here. Um, he's helped us out in the past, and mm. he's been. We're, you know, we're going to use some material from his documentary. A couple of clips. Not, uh, it's not part of the documentary, but it's part of his site. A Michael Payne interview, and I did put links to Max's stuff in the description for everyone to please check him out. But, but getting back to to Michael Payne, this is a very unusual part of the assassination folklore. Uh, we know what Ruth did, but on the quiet side, there's a lot of stuff that Michael did that nobody's aware of. Because when they split 
uh, when she took Marina, he took Oswald, and they did that intentionally. But we'll get into that a little later. I just want to get into his his background. Uh, well, here I I pulled something up. What do you got? Hun? Let's see what you got, Hunley. How about this guy? Uh, out of Massachusetts, I think this is Robert Treat Payne. That's him. Uh, who is the Speaker of the House of Massachusetts and a big wig and one of I think 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, if I'm correct, I think it was 56, maybe 54 uh, people out there who might know, but he's one of them. And this is the great, 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 great grandfather of uh, Michael Payne. I don't know how many greats go in there. Like four or five. I mean, yeah, a there's, a, there's a bunch of greats. There's a bunch of greats. But Michael Payne, uh, this is obviously Robert Treat Payne, um, mm -hmm. who is, like I said, one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. But to also to cover the family, there's also Forbes, there's also Cabot's. Every one of these families is involved in Michael Payne's life. Uh, and Michael Payne is a part of all that stuff. His father was George Lyman Payne Jr., uh, who was the son of George Lyman Payne Sr. Now you say, who is George? This is George Lyman Payne Jr., who was an architect born around 1900, 1901, New York City, uh, a Trotskyite, a complete radical leftist. He works with, a, he's a designer uh, architect, but here's the, here's the rub. And I always wondered, this. people talked about this in New York, the, the city projects in New York, when I say the projects, those are um, the buildings that were designed in the 20s and 30s to house people who were poor and their government housing projects, a.k.a. the projects. And African-Americans refer to it as the project, uh, which is a street vernacular for killing uh, and genocide of African-Americans by putting them in the projects, which is, of course, insane. It's free housing. But nevertheless... Everyone's always talked about the projects and how minimal the design is and how Soviet the design is. Brutalist. You know, right. Okay. This is the guy who designed it. <laughs> this, there's the reason it's like that is because it was designed by George Lyman Payne Jr. Smiley a here. <laughs> a Trotskyite and an avowed Marxist revolutionary um, who was the dad of Michael Payne. So I, 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 in this research, I found out a lot about, um, about him and his father. His father was a minister, an Episcopal minister, who was also a social engineering revolutionary leftist. The father of Mike, the grandfather of Michael Payne, uh, George Lyman Payne Sr. Insane. This is some family. Now, get on the other side of the family. You got the mother. He marries Ruth Forbes. Now, this is the Forbes money, millions and millions of dollars. I think her grandfather was Ralph Waldo Emerson. Uh, the Forbes lady is an artist and uh, gets into ballet. And she gets into different things, Ruth Forbes. But she goes all the way back to the Forbes money. So you've got the Cabot money, which is also in there. The Cabots, like Henry Cabot Lodge, uh, Michael Payne. Uh, Cabot was the... Um, Thomas Dudley Cabot was that's that's the mother, um, Ruth uh, 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 Forbes. That's the mother, Ruth Forbes, who starts this peace project, international peace project with the Russians. She's not actually a commie, but a commie sympathizer and an artist, quote unquote. Now, but he also has a this is really interesting because when we covered the story of the Philippines with McKinley, Eric. Remember, mm -hmm. we, we got into the, the whole Philippine things a little bit. We didn't really go crazy into the Philippines, but it happens on, in the Spanish-American War where McKinley uh, is fighting to take over Cuba and, and the Philippines. There's a guy named um, Cameron Forbes, who is the uncle, the great uncle of Michael Payne, who becomes the governor the, the the like the governor of the Philippines, the military governor of the Philippines, and later the ambassador of the Philippines. So he's involved in imperialistic stuff going back to the late 1800s. That's another one. Henry, uh, 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 Michael Payne's uncle, Cameron Forbes. Uh, Is that so, William Cameron Forbes or just uh, Cameron? No, no, that's Cameron Forbes. That's another guy. William Cameron Forbes, a separate guy. 
Okay. That's another guy. Yeah, I, I forgot what he William Cameron Forbes was the founder. That's his grandfather. William William H. Forbes was the founder of American Bell Telephone. Okay, so that, that's that's the grandfather of Michael Payne, right? Uh, Robert Treat Payne, obviously a great, 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 whatever thing about ba ba. Henry Cabot Lodge was the Republican senator of the state of Massachusetts who ran and had that seat, but lost to JFK. And we'll get into that, the irony of that, that the Cabot lost to JFK in 1952 for the Senate seat. And then later on, he will take Henry Cabot Lodge and put him as ambassador to South Vietnam and is involved in the assassination of the DM brothers, which JFK is trying to avoid being assassinated of the same month that he's assassinated, if you can figure that one out. Uh, Henry, Henry Cabot Lodge uh, may have been deeper into this thing, the assassination of the DM brothers, because Kennedy, I know I'm digressing here a little bit, going up to 1960, but Kennedy uh, orders the embassy in South Vietnam to do everything they can to uh, uh, assure the safety of the DM brothers. And they went, uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, we got it. Like uh, pulling the troops out of Syria under the previous president. Uh, yeah, we got it. We got it. And of course, they were immediately captured uh, by the anti-DM forces in South Vietnam and then executed inside of an armored personnel vehicle, just shot repeatedly down into the vehicle, machine gunning them to death. But <laughs> getting back to Michael Payne, uh, Michael Payne ends up like in 19, I want to say 19. Well, for, OK, Michael Payne. Uh, ends up being an artillery soldier in the Korean War. Okay. This is not a brain, you know, he drops out of Harvard. He went to Harvard, he's a Harvard dropout. He never really gets an engineering degree and he goes to fight in Korea and then comes back and he's like, um, what's it called? Like National Guard or something? Reserves. Yeah. He's in reserves for like six years. So he saw shit in, 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 in Korea, in South Korea, in that war. Uh, for real, Eric, you know, he was really involved in, in, in shootings and rifle stuff and, you know, uh, aggression, aggressive uh, uh, military stuff, despite the fact that he comes off as some sort of, um, you know, a feat um, um, uh, intellectual. He is a very complicated cat and deserves his own episode, as I said. Now, his mother, uh, as I said, Ruth Forbes has a girlfriend, her best friend, Ruth Forbes' best friend for 40 freaking years. By the way, they own Nashuan Island off the coast of Cape Cod, and they summer there. In fact, Ruth Payne will go there to the island with Michael Payne in the summer. They own their own island, but that's a separate issue. The the One of the guests on the island is the girlfriend of his mother, um, friend for many years, and that's a chick named Mary Bancroft. Now, Mary Bancroft, if you have a picture of her, um, this is her in 1945 in Europe, I think in Germany. She is the, a spy in Germany during a war, and she's being run by an obscure cat named Alan Dulles. And Dulles and her are lovers. Uh, this is her, I think, on the right. I forget who that is on the left. but That's Dulles's wife. She was oh, best friends with his wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they have a, they have a brief affair, but this will come back later on during the Warren Commission because Dulles knows who Michael Payne's mother is, and he says if they ever found out the conspiracy people, it would be hell to pay. In the Warren Commission, when Dulles is on the commission, uh, that I knew that I knew uh, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's landlady, as he refers to uh, Ruth Payne. That I knew her, his landlady's family, you know, what I mean, I'm trying to diminish it. But no, Mary Bancroft and Ruth Forbes are best friends. And Bancroft is the mistress of this obscure guy named Alan Dulles. Yeah, no, no connections at all. Just totally no, random people. No, just a random yeah. dude. Just a random yeah. cat. Okay, now here's, here's the beauty of this thing. Oh, one of the many beauties. This is a guy who's living in a working class suburb with Eric, I don't know if Eric was here, but I visited it when I went to Dallas and it's kind of a rundown suburb. You know, he's got a trust fund at this point of over $2 million. He's living in this small house with Ruth Payne, who we've covered in numerous episodes and with the, the uh, uh, documentary by Max Good. Michael Payne, 
at this time, in 1960, 1959, 58, is worth $2 million because of his trust fund with all these Cabots and Lodges and, 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 and uh, Paynes and Forbes and everything else. Why he would be palling around with a broke-ass, maniac, lone nut named Lee Harvey Oswald is bizarre. He works at Bell Helicopter. Just to back up before that, he works with his father, his stepfather. His mother gets divorced from Lyman Payne uh 1932 or so and she marries a guy the third husband is is this arthur lyman the helicopter guy arthur lyman takes uh her son which is his stepson michael payne under his wing and together he begins to show him uh, about helicopters and designing helicopters and he's got them on us on a cord he's got model helicopters he lives up in buffalo new york he's up there in buffalo new york himself um, is this Arthur or? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So Arthur is like, like I said, this brainiac inventor, philosopher, seance holder, uh, weirdo. He's all a weirdo. But he takes Michael Payne under his wing and Michael Payne and his dad begin to, this is a shot of Arthur playing around with one of his early prototypes of the helicopter. Um, together, together, him and Michael will design for Bell Boeing, uh, which will become the U-22 Osprey prototype, uh, Eric. And you know what the Osprey does. You know, I mean, they will design the prototype, which will become uh, that helicopter. But before they get to that helicopter, uh, there's some other helicopters. And he gets to design a helicopter, which will eventually become the, the B-47. I don't know if you, that's the... That's the um, the Bell Prototype 47, which is the bubble helicopter, which knows the Bell 47, which you see in MASH. This is what Arthur uh, designs um, with Michael Payne. That's the bubble helicopter, the quintessential Bell uh, that will be in Vietnam. That'll be a little bit juiced up, but you see it in Korea in 1950s. Uh, this is the 47. This will become a thing that puts Bell on the map. Now, Bell has an interesting vice president. Uh, Bell has a Germanic vice president who has come over to run the company because he knows a lot about uh, things that fly. Okay. And here's a great photo of him. This is at the peak of his power there um, in Germany when he was running the V2 rocket program. This is, of course, General Walter Dornberger, who was brought over in Operation Paperclip. He is brought to Texas and Alabama he will now run the rocket program or the helicopter program for Bell. Um, but he's not really interested in helicopters, I found. He's more interested in some other things, Eric, which I sent you some photos of. The helicopter is fine. That is Bell's commercial thing. But there's another thing that they're into. And one of these is the Rascal. Uh, this is designed by Walter Dornberger. It is the first... Um, air to surface nuclear missile that is given to strategic air command this is surface directed from the air keep that in mind and it's nuclear this is what Dorn we brought over dornberger for operation paperclip this is why we got dornberger not for the helicopter uh, uh arthur can 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 deal with the helicopter this is what dornberger was doing and uh all this stuff about the space program is a crock of shit they left that up to what's his face over there in NASA, you know, Von Braun to launch rockets to the moon. That's not what this guy was involved in. This guy was involved in the new that, and the X-15. There is the X-15, again, designed by the team of Walter Dornberger and his crew. Um, Arthur not involved in that, but um, Arthur Young not involved in that. But still, it's Bell Helicopter and Bell is what I'm saying in cahoots with Boeing. So this is really where we get to see Operation Paperclip Part 3 in its entirety, designing nuclear weapons and, and, and X-15s for us through Boeing and Bell. Now, Young, uh, Arthur Young is designing stuff with Michael. So Michael has a top-level security clearance. I can't stress this enough. It's minimized in all the lone nut literature. He's at Bell. He's working in a Fort Worth. He's living in the suburb of Dallas that I went to in that cockamamie house that's now, by the way, 
it's now a national historic site. I, I know this sounds crazy. It's a national historic site, just like the battlefield at Antietam. <laughs> and, I, and for reasons that uh, only, only somebody connected like Ruth Payne could ever pull this off. You know what I mean? Like, so what? You lived in this house. Who cares? Why is that a national historic site? Why isn't the Texas School Book Depository or Daily Plaza a national historic site? Uh, like Eric pointed out, they're attempting to dismantle this thing before the 60th anniversary even you know comes about. So there's people trying to protect that. But that being said, um, Ruth Payne's house is a national historic site. Well, oh, she's a national treasure. She's a national treasure. Yeah. So the the ASM A2 is the world's first guided nuclear air to surface missile, uh, which has another name, the Rascal, which is what it says on the side of that, which was given uh, when made for Strategic Air Command to launch from midair. Now, the helicopter that Arthur Young designs is the first in 1950 to ever fly over the Alps, Eric. Hmm. Which is pretty impressive. I mean, pretty impressive. It then also flies from Texas to Boston nonstop. I think it's a record that was never broken. Um, really, a long, di like 1,300 miles or something. And then there is 1958, there's the telecopter. And our channel out here in LA, KTLA Channel 5, uh, took the Bell helicopter, put cameras all over it, and in 1958 launched the first telecopter which covered traffic and crime and everything else that we now it's ubiquitous in every city in America. That started here with the first uh, Bell helicopter 47 being rigged out with cameras and then doing traffic um, in LA in 1958, which is kind of interesting, bizarre little sideline. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> Good use of it, I guess. I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, it, it covers crime too and fires and everything else. You know what I mean? Well, and you yeah. have the you have your your crazy ass pilot there who uh, is oh one yeah, of the, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah the trans the trans pilot trans air the trans air pilot the uh, anyway so so Michael Payne is working at um, at Bell and he hooks up with Lee Harvey Oswald which we're going to get into in a second somehow they're brought to this party and uh, George DeMarshall comes to the party and he introduces the Oswalds to the pains uh he he i think they're called the williams the williamses in jfk because oliver told me he didn't want to get sued by a litigious ruth Payne. uh he regrets he regrets now having changed their name uh for jfk because he felt in retrospect that he could have achieved a lot with discovery like we now learn you know from viva and barnes you can get a lot of stuff in discovery and he wishes that he kept her name and that she did sue him. But nevertheless, they're the Williamses in JFK in the movie. If you want to look at that scene at the party, um, DeMore and Schilt is their babysitter. And DeMore and Schilt and his wife uh, babysitting uh, the two of them. And did we do an episode on DeMore and Schilt? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we got into this. Okay, yeah. So there's a guy who he works with, Dave Knoll. Uh, this is Michael Payne. He works at Bell with Dave Knoll. And Dave Knoll and him are talking, this is the day, well, just to move ahead a little bit, the day of the assassination. What is he talking about that day at lunch? He's talking about the characteristics of an assassin. <laughs> just, just to put that out there, we'll get, we'll get back to that in a second. But Dave Knoll talked to um, the FBI afterwards. And so it's kind of odd, like we hadn't heard about the assassination yet, but we're over lunch. Michael Payne is talking about uh, the characteristics of an assassin. Um, That's one word. As one usually does, but um, he he will be meeting them. Now, now co co coincidentally, this is in February of 1963. So February 22nd, 1963, the Paines meet the Oswalds. Um, you know, and there they, they discuss something really interesting, this party at this party. These are all czarist white Russians, uh, anti-communist Russians, let me put it this way, who are defector, not defectors, but people who have assimilated into the Texas oil business with the collapse of the czar in Russia, Eric. So these are uh, immigrants who have come over from former czarist Russia who now live in Texas, many of them in the oil business. Most of them speak fluent Russian. 
uh, Ruth Payne for reasons that are yet to be explained as part of this group, uh, even though she's not a Russian, she speaks fluent Russian. She claims that she wants to improve her Russian by uh, having Marina Oswald live with her. Uh, we had a number of letters that we posted on locals that seem highly romantic, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, you could, if you join locals, you could see those letters. They are really interesting, and we'll get to that in a little bit. But February 22nd, 1963, at this party in uh, Dallas, the Paynes meet the Oswalds. Um, by March 18th, <laughs> by March 18th, Marina is being invited to live with Ruth in a note from Ruth. March 20th, Ruth, Ruth visits her. Physically again, April 2nd, he invi she invites her to uh, dinner. And at that dinner, Michael Payne comes to the dinner. He's already moved out. He's already getting uh, separated from his wife. The second they meet the Oswalds, Michael Payne gets an apartment in Grand Prairie, Texas, a luxury apartment, moves out and says, yeah, we're having some trouble, right? The day after the assassination, he moves back in. The marriage. Mm. Oh, oh, yeah. They don't get divorced till like 1970. And uh, but anyway, they meet the Oswalds. He moves out and um, uh, she Marina is now the focus of Ruth Payne to try to get her to move in. And she said, and, you know, Ruth Payne says, well, she was pregnant. I felt really concerned. She was three months pregnant, for Christ's sakes. Ruth Payne herself had driven across the country in her Rambler uh, at eight months pregnant. I mean, as people play football at eight months pregnant, you know, <laughs> But this is no, no, I'm just saying she was three months pregnant. I, you know, it's kind of a bizarre all of Ruth Payne and, and, and Max Good knows this as well as anybody. All of her explanations are weak. They, they, if you drill down a little bit, they don't make sense and they begin to fall apart. Anyway, she seems to have a strange attraction to Marina Oswald. And I, uh, in the letters, you can see there's a little bit more to it. Uh, April 11th. Ruth visits Marina again, April 20th. They have a picnic at a lake. And this is just nonstop. This is in the span of a month. They're doing all this shit together. Uh, in the fall, Marina's living with her again. In the summer, uh, Ruth goes to Nashuan Island and drives across the country, visits her sister who works at this new Langley uh, CIA headquarters. <laughs> Eric, her sister, is a psychologist for the CIA in the Garrison case under oath, Garrison asks her, uh, what, what did your sister do for the government? She goes, I have no idea. I, I never knew what she did. Well, it's right in the phone book. It says CIA <laughs> in the goddamn phone book. And she denies under oath to Jim Garrison that she ever knew um, what her sister did for a living. Or her father, um, uh, Hyde, who was uh, also CIA, worked for USAID, a CIA front in South America. But getting back to Michael... Michael is now starting to talk politics with Lee Harvey Oswald. And that's encounter that leads to some other strange things. And you go, OK, they talk over dinner. That's that's possible. You have some political thing. He, his father's a Trotskyite and Lee Harvey Oswald claims to be a Marxist. And Michael Payne claims to be something. I'm not sure what he is. Um, it's like a mishmash of politics. And uh, these guys, despite everything they say about, and I, I know I've talked to Max about this, about them being liberals. They're not liberals. The Quaker thing is a front. These are commies. These are out and out commies. And I'm explaining at the end of the show, this is a crock of shit where they decommify themselves. I just made that up. Don't try to use that. They decommify <laughs> themselves and say, well, we're liberals. They're not liberals. These are people working for the CIA on the leftist side of the CIA, the CIA obviously needs people on the left, people on the right. And now we see where the hell the CIA is now. So this may have been a little bit ahead of its time, Eric, you know, back then. So Oswald is now isolated because they've taken his wife essentially away from him. And the, the reason is that uh, he treats her badly. Well, Ruth Payne has never seen him treat her badly. Michael Payne has never seen them have an argument. Uh, Ruth Payne then says she needs to brush up on her Russian. Ruth Payne is teaching the Russian language at a private school. OK, she's a Russian language instructor, for Christ's sakes. All of these people who are white Russians are her friends. And she has hundreds. Yeah, this is the two of them. 
uh, Ruth Payne on the left, obviously Marina on the right. There is a strange, strange attraction between these two, and I, I don't want to get into it right now. Because... No, we covered it uh, on the Ruth Payne episode. I just episodes. want to say <laughs> episodes, but I'm just saying if you join locals, you may be able to get access to the love letters, Eric. Oh, for uh, sure. Right. So anyway, so she um, begins to court uh, Marina Oswald and to lure her in uh, with her daughter, June, and she's pregnant with another kid uh, this is being Marina. But Michael, what does Michael do? Michael and Lee Harvey Oswald begin to go to various right wing uh, meetings around the city of Dallas, especially the ones being given by a general Edwin A. Walker. OK, mm. and at this, right at this original party on February 22nd, 1963, the discussion, which happens at every party, is that Edwin A. Walker is the equivalent of Hitler. And if somebody could assassinate Hitler before he became Hitler, uh, the world would have avoided World War II. And if somebody we're not saying who, if somebody in this room could possibly get the gumption to assassinate Walker, uh, it would be the equivalent of knocking off Hitler before World War II. So this, way, that's the same argument that they use today. The no, 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 it's, argument. A, it's a common argument, but I'm saying the reason it's important is because the guy who calls the Houston Post, the guy who calls the Houston Post on November 22nd, 1963, and tells them that the guy who shot Walker at Walker is Lee Harvey Oswald is none other than Michael Payne. That's why it's interesting. Now, Walker himself calls the newspaper, the National Zeitung paper in, in Bavaria. That's Walker. Walker calls up, but he gets it from the Houston Post. This originates from Michael Payne, not General Walker. The, the Walker calls the German paper, and that makes it an international story. But the Houston Post covers it on November 23rd, which I did not realize, and that came, my friends, from Michael Payne. So Michael Payne, just so you know, if you look at this guy, Michael Payne, you think about it like, why wasn't he a suspect to, to J. Edgar Hoover? Okay. He, he's a commie. His father was a known revolutionary Trotskyite. He has subscriptions to uh, Soviet magazines. He has a membership in the ACLU. Uh, he is a member of CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality. He's associated with convicted draft dodgers. He has relatives associated with the Communist Party. Yet Michael Payne is not a suspect of the FBI or the Warren Commission. This is not. In fact, Robert Oswald, uh, uh, Lee's brother, said to the Warren Commission, I have no idea what these Paynes did, but they're up to their necks in this thing with my brother. And I know that they were involved. That's Robert Oswald. He said, I have no proof of this. But I can tell you right now, these two people are involved in framing my brother. OK, so dig. So the day of the assassination, um, we're going to get to that. But stepping back, he goes to these various meetings with Lee Harvey Oswald. And some of them are ACLU meetings where Lee Harvey Oswald now jumps up and starts debating uh, members of the ACLU. He joins the ACLU, Oswald, so he could become a member and. Only two nonprofits were allowed to deliver mail to his mailbox in the in the post office box, Lee Harvey Oswald's post office box, the ACLU and Fair Play for Cuba Committee. Those are the only two signed uh, companies or, or organizations that he allowed to deliver mail to him uh, were those two organizations as a member. He So he would receive mail from those two organizations. So Michael Payne takes him to the Walker rallies, takes him to ACLU. Now, Michael Payne also goes to SMU, uh, which is the Southern Methodist University. He goes to the lunchroom on occasion. What does he do there? He debates students who are pro-Castro. And he, he is pro-Castro in this guise of debating them. And he alludes to the fact that he was in the Soviet Union, Michael Payne. He alludes to the fact that he came from New Orleans. He alludes to the fact indirectly that he is Lee Harvey Oswald. And you say, well, do they even look alike, Eric? I mean, here's some photographs. You tell me, folks. Look at these four photos of, uh, of Lee Harvey Oswald and Michael Payne. And then Eric found another good one. 
Look at this. Look at this. This guy, Michael Payne, I allege, was one of the doubles in Texas, uh, possibly in the Northeast, possibly in Washington, D.C., possibly in New Orleans, of Lee Harvey Oswald. Look at the eyebrows, the lips. Yep. The, they both have a larger nose that's prominent. Even their ears are similar. Now, I'm leave not that, leave that up there for a second. I want people to see that. Because Michael Payne goes to SMU, and this has all been completely minimized by the Warren Commission, completely minimized by Gerald Posner, completely minimized by uh, Gus Russo and all the, the lone nutters. Uh, this guy uh, should have been the number one guy on Jager Hoover's suspect list with all his communist, Marxist, revolutionary family and, and the fact that he is a Bell helicopter with a security clearance. I suggest to you that he's not even an engineer. I suggest to you that he dropped out of Harvard, does not have a degree, and he is Michael Payne, an agent doing these things under Dornberger and under U.S. intelligence oper uh, operations in and around Fort Worth and Dallas at this time. He's not designing uh, helicopters. That's what his stepfather did. He has no degree in, in engineering or anything else. This is what Michael Payne did. His wife did the female version of what Michael Payne did. These were two operatives, like the Americans. This was a couple that worked together. When he leaves the house, Marina Oswald moves in. Now, look, this may not have had anything to do with the assassination originally. It may just be these are two operatives assigned by the DeMore and Schultz who are going to Haiti. Gene DeMore and Schultz and George DeMore and Schultz are leaving to go to Haiti uh, to do another job, and they turn them over to the, the pains. Uh, but we will see that they get more deeply involved in the assassination as time goes on. So the fact that this woman is able to live out her life up in Northern California in peace is a crime against humanity. She should be indicted today while she's still alive, brought before a grand jury. And I've said this, obviously, to you and also to, to, um, uh, and to Max. I mean, the fact that she's alive, indict this woman before she's dead. But we'll get to that later. I just want to get back to this. There's a phone call uh, the day after the assassination, and it's, ta it's ta tapped. And it may be the Dallas police. We're not really sure. It may have been even Irving, Texas police at this point. But in the tapped phone call conversation, it's Michael Payne uh, calling her from Bell Helicopter, calling Ruth. And in that conversation, he says, we both know that Oswald did the shooting, but we also know who was responsible for this. Hmm. That that's the taped conversation between the two of them. We know Oswald did it, but we also know who is responsible for this whole thing. So in other words, a higher authority was responsible and they were trying to, fr that was the 1123 phone tap, um, which is hard to escape. But the ACLU meeting um, on October 22nd, uh, is the one where Oswald stands up and starts complaining about these liberals doing nothing. He's further to the left than the ACLU. They're going back and forth. They're going back and forth. And this is intentional. When the police come to Ruth Payne's garage, I'm going to show a picture of this garage, uh, the day a Buddy Walters shows up and Gus uh, uh, Russo shows up, uh, Gus Rose, rather, shows up, detectives and the uh, deputy sheriff. This is the garage. Now, in that garage... One of the things that Buddy Walters, the uh, deputy sheriff deputy, seizes out of that garage are file cabinets, small file cabinets. And, and, and Max talks about these files. We had a discussion with Max about these file cabinets. They're seized by Dallas police, uh, sheriff's department in this case. And they're taken back to headquarters. They're small. And um, in those file cabinets are three by five cards of the students at SMU that were interviewed by Michael Payne about their communist sympathizing having nothing to do with the assassination. And also in that garage were not one, but two Minox cameras. You say, well, what's a Minox camera? What could that mean? I mean, anybody could have a Minox camera. But not only was there one Minox camera, there were two Minox cameras. There's a Minox right here. This is a spy camera, uh, takes tiny little film. And um, the fact there's the, the light meter or the, or the foot meter, actually, it's not really a light meter, it's a foot meter. That looks familiar. That looks that looks very familiar. Hold on. Let me see. I think this is my Minox camera right here. You got a picture of, right? Mm -hmm. Is that mine? I think so. Oh, my God. Here's my Minox. 
Here, get a blow up of this. Get a get a blow up of this, Eric. Go off this. Off this. I, I can't zoom you in. No, no, no. I'll, no, no, I'll, no you don't have to I'll, zoom I'll just me. No, no, I'm just putting that up here. This is the Minot camera that is the same one that Michael Payne and Lee Harvey Oswald had. This is the um, the foot meter here, what they call light meter. Um, you can get a, a look at that uh, with the measure with the measurements on the back um, and this chain. Now, the reason this is important. Uh, this is the chain that goes to the camera, to the other case. The Minox camera, uh, which is in my hand right here, had a serial number on uh, Lee Harvey Oswald's Minox and film of, of stuff that Oswald shot in Minsk of military installations that were blown up and, and shots around Minsk. The other camera, which is which is Michael Payne, you wonder why Michael Payne would have a Minox camera. So Ruth Payne says, yes, he has a Minox, but it fell into the salt water in Nashuan Island and never worked again. And I'm going like, okay, who cares about that lady? In other words, she always does these limited hangouts when caught uh, on certain items and comes up with a completely disingenuous uh, rationale for anything about the items that they're discussing. So Michael Payne's uh, Minox does not even have a serial number, which is kind of odd. It's a Minox 3. This is a Minox 1 that Oswald has, which has a serial number, which was recorded. Okay, that's interesting. They take the stuff down to headquarters, right? And it goes to the FBI. Now, show is a shot of uh, maybe of all the stuff that they took out of the garage. That's Oswald's out of his sea bag. There's a shot I send with some arrows, Eric. Right. Oh, okay. Oh, you want the evidence? Yeah, sorry. I yeah, just, the, not, not the list, just the photo of the stuff on the floor. I mean, it's a, not that we're going to see anything, but you get the idea. These are this is from Dallas police uh, showing you the Minox cameras and the and the things that go with it. Now, I just wanted to put that out there because I'll tell you why. When it's sent back to the FBI, the FBI sends it back, and the Minox camera disappears from the list of uh, evidence that's on the on the thing there. They they delete it. The FBI. They then contact Gus Rose, the detective who found the Minox camera. And the FBI tells him it's a light meter. And he says, no, it's not. And they go, come on, Gus. Come on, play ball, boy. And Gus Rose doesn't want to play ball. Gus Rose will never buckle on the fact that he found that Minox camera in Oswald's sea bag. Okay. Gus Rose will then be found out to be the corrupt cop in the thin blue line 21 years later in Errol Morris's documentary where he framed someone for murder. But that's a story for another day. On this day, Gus Rose refuses to buckle uh, about the fact that he found the Minox. And in fact, it's listed on their inventory list. And there's photos of the Minox in the Dallas police custody. And the second Minox is even more interesting to me because it explains uh, that Michael Payne was an intelligence operative. And in fact, Michael Payne uh, kind of steps on his own storyline by saying when he met Oswald for the first time, he showed him the infamous photo of the Oswald with the Malika Carcano and the militant and the worker magazines and his handgun. That photo, um, he claims, was shown. He's, he's, he's altered his story a couple of times, Michael Payne, 1993, uh, CBS News, he claimed he saw it the first night he met Oswald. And then his wife said, no, you didn't. You never told me that. You would have said something. So there's some daylight between her and him on the actual photo. Another one will appear uh, in a record album uh, put in storage uh, for George de Morinchild. When George de Morinchild returns from Haiti, uh, lo and behold, he finds another photo, same one, and it says, ha, 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 is George. It says, ha, 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 uh, killer of fascist on the back of the photo. And people believe this is a forgery. It was originally supposed to be written by Marina Oswald, and it was not. She says, that's not my handwriting. I never wrote that. Uh, that is now the second photo, supposedly in the possession of George de Morinchild when he returns from Haiti. But that's a story that we did before. So the, the reality of it is the the... Uh, Marina Oswald will later say um, that the connection between her and Ruth, interestingly enough, this is during the Garrison trial, 1967, she was told by the Secret Service not to interact any longer with, here she is, there's a photo of her being sworn in, uh, the grand jury, 
it, this is in the Garrison case in 67, it would look bad if the public found out the connection between me and Ruth and the CIA. That's the actual quote uh, to the grand jury by Maureen Oswald. You can do what you want with that. That's a weird quote. I don't know. Uh, he, she sends her this cookbook. Uh, I don't know if it's a cookbook, whatever the hell it was. But in the cookbook, she, as, when Ruth Payne is separated from Marina, she goes crazy trying to still contact her to get their story straight. She tries everything. And the CIA, uh, uh, the Secret Service has her in a motel uh, for months, for months. And Ruth Payne is trying to get at her nonstop all different methods, the phone, letters, books. She, you left this behind, this, this incredible loaf of bread. Look inside of it, I think. Any way she can. <laughs> so she sends through the, through the Irving police, she sends her a book, cookbook, or, or, uh, and, and, and she says, uh, I, she left this behind. Can you please give this to Marina? Okay, they give her the book to Marina. Inside of the book, is an envelope. In that envelope is the supposed letter in Russian written by Lee Harvey Oswald on what to do if he's arrested after the shooting of Walker. Doesn't mention Walker in the letter. It's, uh, you know, the keys of the mailbox. Here's how you pay the gas bill. That letter is in the book. This is months after the assassination, a month and a half. Somehow the Secret Service didn't find it. Somehow Dallas police didn't find it. Nobody found it. Ruth Payne says, I didn't know there was anything in there. How could I know? <laughs> so anyway, so the, the Secret Service gets this letter, which leads to that quote that I just read, you know, that the Secret Service has their own plan of what to do with Marina Oswald. And they don't want uh, uh, Ruth Payne involved in that plan of, of mucking up their works. You know what I mean? Um, it's kind of interesting because even today, even to this day, the Payne's um, family, um, you know, in the Warren Commission report, I think there's all 218, 258, uh, 600 to 629. All of those are sealed. Warren Commission documents are sealed. This is separate from their taxes. I'm not talking about the, the taxes or the pains. Those are sealed for national security to this day. OK, that's weird. It's like the 28 page memo on the 9-11, uh, uh, you know, attackers that are sealed in the skiff that nobody can read that that talk to uh, Prince ba talk about Prince Bandar funding the operation. This, to this day, the relatives of the Paines are sealed for national security within the Warren Commission documents themselves. You could take that to the bank, my friend. That's an oddity. Anyway, so Buddy Walters finds, uh, Buddy Walters, who will also find a stray bullet with uh, Barrett, the FBI agent on the grass in front of the Texas School Book Depository, Buddy Walters, <laughs> she, he said, Buddy Walters said, she she invites them in. Come on in. There's, I can't believe you're here. I've been waiting for you to search my house. Do we need a warrant? No, you don't need a warrant. Come on in. So they go in. They tear the house apart. And they go into her bedroom. She goes, please don't come in here. This is my bedroom. <laughs> right? So what do they find? They find the projector, the lesbian films, her collection of porn. And you oh, you can't take that. Well, yes, we can, ma'am, because we're, it's evidence. Well, can I get it back? Well, eventually you'll get it back. But we're going to have to look at it down at the station, me and Detective Rose, you know, not that we see anything here, but we're carefully. Look, carefully examine these films. And this could be the Sapruta film lady. We don't know. So they take her lesbian films. How do we know that? Because they went to the station. They watched them. She went crazy trying to get these love letters back from the Warren Commission and get her porn films back from the Dallas police. Now, how do we know that? Because the Dallas police were wrong. They assumed, just for argument's sake, they belonged to Michael Payne, these lesbian films. So they Which went, normal. Right, they, films. They, they <laughs> went to Michael Payne and they said, do you have, are these yours? And he said, no, nah, I've never seen those before. Well, I'm sorry we bothered you. You know, now, now we got a horse of another color. <clears throat> so we've got Ruth Payne, Marina Oswald, lesbian films, a projector, and love letters. <laughs> I'm just going to have a little Capri break here while we um, get the story going. So anyway, so Gus Rose. That's Buddy Walters. That's, that's Buddy Walters. Yeah. The Gus Rose says when, when they were searching the house, all of a sudden uh, a guy says, I'm here. 
I can, I'm here to help you. What can I do? Hello. And it's Michael Payne. He, he took off from work and he drives home. And before he leaves work, he's with this guy, uh, 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 Noel, that I was talking about, who says that he was talking about the characteristics of an assassin uh, before they, uh, they, they knew about the assassination. And he said, this is from Noel. Noel said that he started shaking uncontrollably like he had Parkinson's disease, Michael Payne, and almost fell off the chair when he, when he came to some realization that it was Oswald or someone who worked in the Texas School Book Depository. And he had said, I can't work any longer. I have to go home. And uh, almost passing out, he said he turned white. And he went home. Uh, and then when he gets home, he's like Ricky Ricardo. Lucy, I'm home. Lucy. And then they, he comes in. He sees the cops. And he clams up. Uh, uh, Walters and Rose said he never said another word during the search. Uh, mm. the, ser the search goes into the garage. They all go into the garage. What's in the garage? The garage has a blanket. It's a green blanket. The green blanket is, is you know, what Ruth Payne says. And uh, they bring in Marina. And that blanket is supposed to contain Oswald's rifle. That's right. That's where it goes. Right. Okay. So they're all there. Now, nobody has ever seen that rifle in that place. Nobody's ever seen it. Nobody's ever said they've seen it. They simply say, Michael Payne, who has moved that blanket with the rifle numerous times by his own uh, admission. I've moved it around the garage. I thought it was camping equipment. Okay. It's a guy who served in the artillery. I just want to point this out. In Korea, in the war, he was in the reserves currently for six years. He does not know the feeling, as you know, Eric, of a rifle wrapped in a blanket. So preposterously insane as to be laughable. However, that's the argument, that the blanket is opened and voila, there's no rifle. Well, maybe there was no rifle to begin with. Maybe it was a blanket. It was we a super light rifle. It was a super light rifle. And so <laughs> anyway, to explain the plot line, Oswald, who has been coming home on Friday nights with Buell Frazier, Wesley Buell Frazier, comes home on Thursday night. And the idea is he's got to get the rifle, go back on Friday, shoot the president in the head, and then deny he ever did it for reasons that nobody knows. Because they're all claiming, oh, by the way, two people repeatedly tell the police and uh, the Dallas police that he, there's a quote, he's a nut. Ruth Payne and Wesley Buell Frazier both use the same uh, phrase, he's a nut, um, out of the blue, not even together. They tell the cops that he's a nut about Oswald. Then they both know. So in theory, there's Buell Wesley Frazier, who owns a uh, British Enfield 303, which is seized by the Dallas police and Gus Rose. He's brought back, interrogated, uh, given two lie detector tests, shits in his pants. They tell him he's going to go to the electric chair in Huntsville. He then says there's curtain rods. Uh, that uh, Oswald told him he's got to pick up some curtain rods. And that's where the story comes from. Oddly enough, Frazier, for one of his summer jobs, worked in a department store in Dallas, and he worked in the, hold it, curtain rod department, shipping curtain rods. Just an oddity we found in his new memoir that came out a couple of months ago. Anyway, so the curtain rod story comes from Frazier, um, he is uh, coming back on Thursday night, Oswald, he, which he does. He sleeps over. Now, Ruth Payne will say that Oswald went into the garage in the middle of the night to get his rifle. And the physics of this are never explored. All she says is somebody left the light on in the garage. He goes to bed at 930. Marina doesn't go to bed till 1130 at night. This is Thursday night. And somehow after that or before that, he sneaks into the garage disassembles his rifle in the garage, wraps it up in brown wrapping paper that he's stolen from the Texas School Book Depository, that heavy-duty brown wrapping paper that they will themselves, the Dallas police, create after the assassination up on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository and come down with the wrapping that they claim has no fingerprints of Oswald, but is how he got the rifle into the building, despite the fact that nobody saw this, including the doc. Uh, uh, a boss who yoked the loading dock in the back in the morning, and also Lenny Mae Randall's mother, uh, who's also Frazier's mother, who lives, you know, next door. 
So Frazier's mother, Lenny Mae Randall's mother, will tell the FBI that Lee Harvey Oswald had nothing in his hand except a small parcel, which was this big, which was his lunch, which he put into the pocket of his jacket, which was a sandwich. Keep in mind. Okay. So who shows up as the search is going on? You know, we got a, a whole party of people showing up. Michael Payne shows up, right? Uh, Lenny Mae Randall shows up. Hey, how's it going? How is everybody? Hey, you know what you guys should do? Go over the Texas School Book Depository because my brother works there and he got Lee Harvey Oswald a job there. And they go, what? And he goes, yeah, you should go over there right now. He's probably still there. And that's Lenny Mae Randall telling Dallas police that the assassin works at the Texas School Book Depository. That's where that comes from. It comes from Lenny Mae Randall, who will back up her brother while her mother contradicts both of them about the package that Oswald supposedly brought the next morning on Friday to go to the Texas School Book Depository with Wesley Buell Frazier. Good Lord. You got enough dots yet, people? There's enough freaking dots for you here? So anyway, so Frazier is going to go to the electric chair. So he cooperates with them. And, and the question becomes, why is this guy shooting General Walker? Why would Oswald shoot General Walker? What Does Oswald even have a gun? There's no record that he ever picks it up. There's no record of the mail order thing could have been sent in by anyone. The post office box has, the, has a, a thing saying somebody picked up the rifle, but not him. He didn't sign for it. There's no signature of him. Um, the Walker bullet, the bullet that went into Walker's wall, Eric, will be a steel jacketed 30 odd six, not a copper clad 6.5 millimeter Carcano bullet. OK, hmm. keep in mind, I, just so you people know. These are two different bullets. And why do we know that? Because Walker told us that. And Dallas police told us that, that these are two different bullets. The 30-odd-6 steel jacket is shot by a rifle. There's two guys in, in a getaway car. One of them is a 1958-59 black Chevy. And, well, where do we see that? I don't know if, if Eric has it. But there's a 59 black Chevy in the driveway of, of Edwin Walker's house. And the Dallas police cut out the license plate with a razor. And Marina Oswald talks about the fact that it used to have a license plate. And now it doesn't have a license plate. The license plate was owned by a, a guy named Charles Clear, K-L-I-H-R. This is just for the historical record. Maybe we'll do an episode on him. But that car was one of uh, the crew uh, of Walker. And Walker had a lot of dissension within his crew. There was a lot of gay stuff going on. Walker was gay. There was other guys who were gay. Surrey. There were some kids that he brought back from, from, from Germany who were the rifle team. Uh, as we covered in the episode, I believe, that Walker had championship rifle teams every year out of Germany, Eric, right? Yeah. We, well, yeah in both, one of the two episodes. We did two episodes on Yeah. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, so Walker... Uh, you know, laughs it off about Oswald because this is April 10th, the shooting. This, you know, this is months and months and months before the the assassination. But uh, uh, Walker is the one that all of a sudden calls the German paper because he sees it in the Houston Post. And that comes from Michael Payne, my friend. And the, the story is, if he could kill Walker, he could kill Kennedy, even though there's no political sense for any of these things. Yeah, but they needed that to establish that he well, was that, a mad, that, mad dog killer. That and the Tippett killing, you know, that and yeah. the fact that he killed Tippett. He killed so many people, it was just ridiculous. He was a mad dog killer. But the, the complications involved in this plot, the amount of work that goes into it, just with the pains, if you just look at the pains, how much involved they are with getting him the job at the Texas School Book Depository, with taking him to these meetings, the ACLU and, and the Walker rallies. I mean, the sheep dipping of Lee Harvey Oswald. And, and I, I think they were working together. I think Oswald and Payne were, or, you know, were working together to gather intelligence on radical groups in Dallas. You know, whether they turned on him and made him a patsy, that's what, that's what uh, Oswald says. But here's something, if you want to show that footage that Max gave us now, this, this last piece of footage, a little bit of it, of, of Michael Payne before he died uh, that Max just gave us this week. I'll explain a little bit. Uh, uh, 
new information about Michael Payne after this. Just show us about 30 seconds as we get the flavor of this. Is Michael Payne at the end of his life? Those okay. things inspire him. He really hated everything about the government. And what he hated, I think, was uh, any any control over him. He didn't like the Soviet Union, I think, it was because there he wasn't allowed to have a gun. Stupid. But he's been confined by his uh, that society. Uh, and uh, so I wanted people to realize that here was an instance that man, uh, if he had wanted to, if he had, we didn't know at the time that he had already killed somebody. But if, uh, well, if he had hmm? attempted to kill somebody, attempted. Yes, well, and very, and planned it for a week, so he had been you know, Get your story uh, straight, man. Come on. Information I told time. you, Michael, that, the story. Uh, but, uh... Okay. There's, <laughs> a couple of, there's, there's a couple of things I wanted to address here. During that entire segment, which goes on for a long time, Ruth Payne is banging pots and pans. And, and, and I said this to, to Max this week. I said, was she intentionally doing it to ruin the sound of this, and in fact, he doesn't use it in his film. Uh, the audio is, is screwed up because she's banging stuff nonstop during that interview. And in fact, that becomes an outtake. And Max says, I don't know, but I wouldn't put it past her. He told me this morning. Um, <laughs> and so he didn't know for sure. I mean, I think that's why she was doing it. It is. It goes through the whole interview of her just banging stuff nonstop and then correcting him uh, when he gets something quote unquote wrong like like the Walker killing, you know what I mean? Like uh, uh, mistakenly saying a, a leg, attempt to kill Walker. Um, but nevertheless, he has some interesting takes on stuff. There's the right. license. That's the car that belonged to Charles Clear. We now understand that's in 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 Turtle Creek. Um, I was at that house. That's the I think the back of the house. Uh, but that's the Walker house. Um, of course, the kid who was at the church saw the two cars drive away. Um, thereby negating the idea that Oswald took a bus and buried his gun in, in the bushes or some other Um, But nevertheless, the the license plate was cut out by intelligence operatives who did not want anyone to be distracted that Oswald did not do this. And that's why that license plate was cut, was cut out. And uh, anyway, so Payne uh, changes his story because originally he says that Oswald had nothing but good things to say about JFK repeatedly. He said that his only uh, negative comments were about Walker. Uh, now he's saying in, in, in the 90s and 2000s that, that uh, uh, Oswald didn't like Kennedy, but that's not the truth because many people heard him talk about how much he did like Kennedy. So he begins to flip his story. He flips his story on that and a couple of other things, but the main flipping is what I told you the other day. My, my favorite flip is the fact that he now believes, this is according to Michael Payne, who is now deceased 2018 or 19, he now believes that Oswald acted without knowing that there were other assassins and saw through his scope the other uh, bullets hitting the president and shot at him, but didn't complete the job, that there were other people unbeknownst to Oswald also shooting, having nothing to do with Oswald. And that's why Oswald said, I'm nothing but a patsy. And, and he was shooting, but he was not alone and felt that he was the patsy and they didn't have the other guys. Now, this is from Michael Payne. This is Michael Payne. I don't know if he says that right here, but. He, he made his shot. So there could have been. Uh, ah. If there. No, I was just thinking about it. Uh, it was not totally unreasonable. If there was a totally different group that wanted to get him, Kennedy killed, they would have chosen that time and just whether when he was going, he could have been on two different streets. I think he probably be, was following uh, Kennedy. And he was also looking at following Kennedy through his four power microscope telescopic sight there. So he would know exactly whether his shot had killed Kennedy or somebody else's shot. And that, that was the thing I thought 
uh, more recently, I mean, past year, uh, if somebody, if there had been another person, he would have known about it. He would have seen it, it wasn't his shot, uh, and Kennedy was, was killed, was shot. Uh, so he would know that uh, there had been another group, and here he was being the only one who was being uh, up on, being fingered out as, you're the one. Wow. Yeah, that's what I was referring to. And that's from the outtakes of Max Good's documentary uh, on the assassination. And uh, folks, I have a link to Max's YouTube channel in the description. You might want to go check it out. Subscribe. Yeah. Stuff. And go back and look at our two episodes on uh, Ruth Payne if you really want to check it out. And you'll see the link of, of the three episodes and how they all intersect. Uh, no one's ever really focused on Michael Payne. Um, Keep in mind that both Michael Payne and DeMornchild, is another thing I learned, were proficient in hypnosis. Okay? I know that's a weird kind of thing, um, but it's kind of odd that both of them were hypnotists on top of that. And his father, like I said, Arthur Young, was a, uh, a guy who ran seances and believed in the afterlife and some other mumbo jumbo. So there's a lot of weird stuff going on here uh, besides just... Um, you know, a guy who worked at Bell Helicopter. But getting back to Michael Payne, I believe that the Trotskyite does not fall that far from the tree. Because I said to Max, where do they live? Like, what is going on up there? Because he just, he said he went up last week and he saw Ruth Payne with a couple of other movie makers who were making another film. Mm -hmm. uh, a, guy named, a guy named John Kirby who did, remember we did that film we saw, uh, Four Who Died, Eric, when we were in Dallas. They were having mm -hmm. a screening of it of mm -hmm. Malcolm X, Kennedy, Rock, both Kennedys, and Martin Luther King. That guy, Kirby, and his producer, the woman we met, went up with Max last week to talk to Ruth Payne. So anyway, ah. it was in a nursing home now. But I said, where do they live? What was, when you, originally, where was, what was going on originally? Where is this place? And it turns out, this is really odd. They live in a place called Green Valley Village up in Sebastopol, up in uh, uh, Sonoma County, all the way in Northern California. And what they created was a communist society. Um, with, no, no, I, 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 it's astounding because if you go to the website, you will see all of their manifesto, a utopian society with people living in there. It's called Green Valley Village. It's up in Sonoma based on 2005 hundreds and hundreds of acres owned by Michael Payne. Uh, there's a Michael Payne LLC. He is the founder of it. This is where it went to. And this is what Bill Gates wants to do. This is what all of the World Economic Forum wants to do. They want these utopian bubble societies to exist with all of the great unwashed like us on the outside, you know, clinging to Bibles and guns, whatever the hell we do when we're not in a, in a utopian society. Nevertheless, I stumbled onto this last night. I could not stop reading about it. Maybe we'll put a link up uh, on Locals about this society that they've created up there. It's absolutely fascinating. And they, for years, they were looking for land. And the land, the guy was called the Land Seeker. Um, <laughs> the Land Seeker was a guy named Chris Payne, the son. He was in charge of finding the land for the utopian society. And he found the land, 158 acres up there, and then another 30, 170 acres uh, with a building and other buildings on it. Chris Payne changes his name to Chris Payne, P-A-N-Y-M. In 2005, he marries a woman named Kai. And I think this is to avoid any foot traffic leading back to him from the Payne legacy. But he is the descendant, obviously, the son of Michael and Ruth Payne. So his trust fund will be intact also. Um, he also worked with Arthur Young, uh, the grandfather, who was his grandfather, um, on certain mumbo jumbo. I'm not really sure what he did on consciousness raising stuff out of Stanford. There's an entire communist society that they've created, hundreds of people living there. I'm going to go up there. I'm going to explore this thing at some point. I'm going up. Don't try and stop me, Hunley. I'm going to, no, no, I'm going to make believe that I am going, because it says how you apply to get in there. You have to have certain skills and beliefs, ecosystems, all this mumbo jumbo. So it already tells you how you're going to act and think. And when it says 
you show up like at 10 o'clock with your work clothes to work with them with work gloves, do some work. Then they give you dinner and then it's utopian. We all take care of the children. This has happened in American history. I remember the 1970s. It also happens in the 1880s when we were talking about under McKinley and the previous president, how they were setting up utopian societies, socialist ones. This is a socialist one in California or Christian ones. And we saw the Shakers in upstate New York and other societies around the country. This has happened periodically during crazy times in American history where groups try to create utopian societies to avoid the chaos that the rest of us is stuck with. And I can't believe that they that this was Michael Payne's goal. In other words, kill the president and create your own utopian society. Now it's beginning to make sense to me what they were doing. They, they, the Quaker thing's a crock of shit. They created a upscale, you know, ethnic commune that's communist. And if you read the website, you'll see that they're looking. They've got X amount of cattle, X amount of goats. They've got these chickens. You know got, who else would hang out there? Who? I bet you Sidney Gottlieb would feel very. It's a perfect Sidney Gottlieb thing. But it's also something that you might see uh, move to Guyana in a group like Jim Jones, mm -hmm. also out of San Francisco, also out of the Northwest. There or is the a, Mel Lyman from the Northeast. Yeah, the Lyman <laughs> one never really took off like the ones in the Northwest. But yeah, Lyman too. The Northwest ones, a lot of it has to do with weather, obviously, Eric. You can't survive mm -hmm. in a utopian naked sex cult in the Northeast. It's hard. <laughs> I tried. Mark it. tried. I, uh, it we was called the, the Sonora we have an episode. If you want to see my attempt <laughs> to form a, a communal sex cult, go to the Sonora House episode. It's hard. Especially when there's 40 <laughs> feet of snow, you have no insulation in your house, and you're living with cold stoves. Florida is a better choice if you're going to be east. Or Northern California, to be honest with you, or, you know, mm. with, with Manson country. I mean, look, there's more cults in California historically than any state in the country. I mean, this is what they do here. You don't see them in Texas. I'll put it that way. You don't see them in Florida either. <laughs> anyway... This is where the pains ended up. Now, Ruth is in some sort of a nursing home. Michael went to a nursing home before that, uh, some kind of a Quaker friendly house or something they went to. But nevertheless, this is where this communal communist society that was involved in the killing of the president ended up in the 2000s. Man. <laughs> Somehow perfect. But then didn't she travel to like try to establish beachheads in Latin America, Nicaragua. She was kicked, she was kicked out of Nicaragua. Yeah, uh, right. as member as a CIA operative, they outed her in the in the eighties. So yeah. I'm just saying they ended up in their own utopian society, which is now ongoing, and it's now uh, uh, the land is owned by the Payne family. Yep. Well, this, uh, now, the now the now the, the Payne family. I take it back. The Payne family. Yeah, well, CIA, Colt, Manson, Ruth Payne, the Payne. I mean, it, you can't it, make it this is. up. You can't make this up. I mean, it's just this goes back to 1958 at this point. This is, you know, going back to 1963, this entire lineage now. I mean, but it goes back even further because of the depth of, of the family. I mean, the fact that Henry Cabot Lodge was involved in the killing of the DM brothers in South Vietnam against the wishes of JFK, who will later be assassinated a few weeks later in Dallas. I mean, uh, that's a Cabot. I mean, uh, he, he looked at Cabot as a Republican, but he wanted to have a bipartisan administration. So he gave Cabot the ambassadorship to South Vietnam to get back to that original story I was telling you at the beginning. Mm. And Cabot, Cabot effed him in the end. By the way, one more thing about them, because uh, I'm seeing people are saying they got divorced in the 70s. They were always together, even at the end when Max yeah. is interviewing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't help but wonder if they were double bearded. Again, there's bisexuality involved in all the agents. Uh, Oswald mm -hmm. had done stuff. Marina had done stuff. This is, this goes with the territory. Walker. Not, done stuff. <laughs> Walker. <laughs> I, and all of them. You know, you got the whole group really? down in New, New Orleans yeah. down there. So. Just very, very interesting. And it would make sense that they still hang out together. because, Of they, course, because they got to cover each other's back. Look, mm -hmm. she's speaking as Max is filming. She's hovering around as he's interviewing her husband. 
to interest, put in the truth that we discussed this. Come on, Michael, how many times? You know, and she's there. She doesn't go to the bathroom. She doesn't go, I'll be out gardening. Oh, no. She's hovering around to do what she just did on that tape. It's quite telling, my friends. Uh, and now Michael's gone. She doesn't have to worry about Michael that much. You know, the son, yep. Chris, I don't know what Chris is going to do um, in terms of being a cult leader. I'm sure he's aspiring. to. So run. Chris is not the filmmaker then? He's not the filmmaker. No, I looked at the photo. I have photos of this guy now. I found he's okay. on the website. He's on the website. Oh, OK. Put it up on Locals later because I'm curious, too. OK. Yeah, I will. I will. Yeah, it's a good story. Green Valley Village, my friend. Sebastopol, upstate New York, upstate California. Northern California. The uh, it's it's a, that's I'm going to I'm going to go up there. I'm telling you right now. Well, wait, wait, wait. You know, I also heard a rumor that their daughter is in like a coven of some kind. Right. I think she's in a witchcraft. The yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you know what? We, going. <laughs> we might have to do a follow up on the kids of the of the pains, the pain kids. We, we might the next generation. I'm now, let me just show you how vast the Treat uh, Williams family. Show up this picture of Treat Williams because he's also part of this Robert Treat Payne family. Just passed away. The great actor Treat Williams is part of it, and there was uh, there's Treat Williams. He's also part of this family. Uh, just passed away in a motorcycle accident up in Connecticut. And also, we there was a guy around for president, Eric, uh, hmm. who was who was a Forbes, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, Do you have a picture of him or? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a yes. I who married yeah. a Heinz, married a ketchup heiress, who was a total drunk. Look at this guy. Look at that middle name. There's a John Forbes Carey. Yeah. Oh, interesting. So he's part of this operation too. Boy, the plot just thickens, Hunley. Mm-hmm. This, this may be a deep state. This may be, I mean, the reason I'm interested in the pains because with the mix of politics and family that I've said Perfect to you. Perfect CIA crop. Right. This is what I've been saying to you people from day one when I did the CIA series of how they like to work in families that have long lineages so they can trust them. Well, you don't have a longer lineage than the signer of the Declaration of Independence, for Christ's sake, and, and, and all the Forbes and Cabots and everyone else who have been you know, the, 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 the governor of the Philippines in, in 1901 and all these other um, uh, cabots doing different things. I mean, this is where the deep state goes. You want to call it the CIA, the deep state, whatever you well, want. Well, and also the corporate tie, too. You know, you get the Forbes, that, because th there's that handshake between the government. Who's really running who? You know, the military industrial complex. Well, they're part of that industrial complex. It's, well, uh, right. I mean, it, it, Cabot, uh, uh, the uh, Thomas Dudley Cabot is the president of United Fruit Company, who is his cousin. So, I mean, they, they are Republic. physically, <laughs> they are physically, you know, the head of companies. You know what I mean? Physically running things on the corporate side. Exactly. exactly. Right. And then never got... leave that out. Don't leave that out. That's a, that brings us back to Smedley Butler <laughs> and on and on. And I, th on. Th I think Butler figures this out midstream and just says, you know, realizes he's a pawn in their game. Mm. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a couple named Fred and Nancy Osborne, and they vouch for the pains to the FBI to get back to that thing like, why wasn't the FBI on the pains? And their dad ran the Crusade for Freedom, the uh, Fred Osborne's dad. Uh, and that was a, a group that was a CIA uh, front um, that was a patriotic group run by um, uh, Fred Osborne's father. And they vouch, for, uh, how they vouch, I don't know, but they vouch to the FBI about Michael and Ruth Payne saying they're good people. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Dude, there's a lot of stuff here, but. You know, I hope people can digest this. You may have to watch this twice, but yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> Wait through. So, Michael Payne died. I think not that long. Not no, long 2019. After the yeah, no, 2019. I think. Yeah, and I think that interview is from 2019. Yeah, I think he dies later that year. Which is a... maybe they took him out because he, he was giving him too many interviews. Because he does say in that interview, "Yeah, I should have written a book." And the guy who's the handler of Ruth Payne that, that uh, Max talked about in the background says, yeah, why don't you write a book? And he's going, hey, you know, I don't like to write. He goes, but I'm forgetting a lot of stuff I should have written down. And the guy's going, yeah, let's write it down. Let's do a book. Come on. And I thought, of course, they want to write a book with Michael Payne so they can insert whatever they want into that goddamn book. And the handler is in the background. The guy who Max said had the file cabinets that is a souvenir that he showed Max. The ones that were seized in the garage. 
He had one of the file cabinets as a souvenir, the handler of Ruth Bain. You Man, you, you can't make this crap up. I'll tell you that much, my friends. No, you can't. But on that note, um, we've got some support coming in here. What? Yeah, we got new members. Algernon Meekins, I have to tell you, he became a member of the channel at like 11 o'clock this morning. Like, you know what? That might be a phony name. He might just be doing that to become a member. Well, you know what? He succeeded. He mm. is a member. <laughs> and Lisa Franceschi is back. Thank you very much, Lisa. Lisa's into the show. I got to tell you that right now. Okay. I just want to, while we have a break, we're on the commercial. So we're going to do today's Heroes of the Blues is the legendary Sleepy John Estes, who is a big name. Even people who don't know the blues will know that Sleepy John Estes, uh, one of the most expressive vocalists. Estes was born in 1899, Ripley, Texas. Uh, he later moved to his lifelong home of Brownsville, where he learned guitar from Hambone Willie Newburn. Between 1929 and 1941, recorded 50 sides, generally in an ensemble format that marked a departure from the usual country blues. Estes tunes were notable for their references to local people and events. He died in 1977. Very famous guy, Sleepy John Estes. Even uh, non-blues aficionados will know him. Today's hero of the blues. Go on. Uh, okay. Thanks, Hunley. Thanks, Hunley. Well, but thank, thank you. Um, oh, but... also, I just wanted to point this out. This is a new book I just got uh, via Vince Palomara. Uh, just Ooh. came out. This is uh, thanks to the people in the book fund because um, this is, again, another $25 book that I'm you know using the book fund, uh, Cash App, Venmo, and PayPal money. And Vince has written this book. Uh, we're going to try to get him on the show at some point mm -hmm. to promote the book. Um, it is a kind of like an encyclopedia of conspiracy and thoroughly footnoted. I'm going to have to read it over the weekend and get into it. Uh, but it really is a footnoted book by Palomaro, all the different conspiracy theories. Really interesting. Almost like, um, a new version of that encyclopedia, which I posted. Yeah. Up. Yeah. It's a, right. But he's got a lot of documentation in here and a lot of visual stuff, um, I'm going to have to take a look at it. But yeah, this this is where the book fund money goes, people, just in case you don't think you think it's going to drugs and booze. It's not. It's going to books. See, mine goes to beer and hot dogs. Right. But this one actually goes <laughs> this actually goes to books. So if you want to contribute, you can go to my PayPal. And if you hate PayPal, go to Cash App or Venmo. But thanks. All right. Um, let me go through the locals tips real quickly. Pasha Moyer sent a tip. Sorry I had to miss last week's Freeform Friday. Here's a meme tangentially related to last week's AUS. It's Come On Bobby, the original object, and it's a picture of Robert Lincoln. Cute. Because, okay. uh, well, we talked about Lincoln with McKinley and the fact that Robert Lincoln had to show up for every assassination. By the way, it's Robert Todd Lincoln, but he's been called Todd Lincoln or Robert Lincoln. Some, some wise guy thought we had it all wrong because we said Robert Lincoln. It's Robert Todd Lincoln. Uh, yeah, I've heard of both okay. ways. His middle name is Tom. It doesn't matter. Eric's wife. <laughs> right. Well, and the funny thing is that the uh, picture has a signature on it, and it looks like he signed it. Oh, Robert Lincoln. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. I know. So go, go. It's like, it's like saying Lee Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald. Dude, it's Lee Harvey Oswald. You know. And everybody called him Lee. Lee. Yeah. <laughs> Lee uh, actually, uh, his Lee name. Oswald. And I think I've heard in interviews, and it always throws me off. When they go, well, Lee Oswald did blah, blah, blah. You know, the people right. who knew him. Right. They, how... Nobody runs around saying people's middle names, you know, uh, unless you're a serial killer. Exactly. Um, Guilty as Jumbo sent a $13 tip what? coming at you live from Box 13. Oh, Glad I got to be you. part That's of this funny. crew. That's funny. There's enough dots here to make a few microfilms. Boy, I'm nauseous from these dots. Holy crap. <laughs> um. Pigeon, Pigeon Be Gone sent a $10 tip. Lord Buckley would agree. Hand puppets are required with a voice. Hand puppets are required with a voice. Your, okay. your Ruth Payne voice. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm not big on hand puppets. I never really got into that. No, I know. I, know. And but somebody... I wish I, it would be great to have them as hand puppets. That would be funny. Just oh, to do a, whole, do a whole play where you have one, I have one, you know. <laughs> what are we going to do? I don't know. What do, we, do you want to talk to Marina? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And then somebody said, is that close to Gav Governor Newsom's vineyards? Uh, yeah, it is actually. <laughs> Somehow not surprised. Yeah. Yeah. Got a rumble rant. Escaped hamster. Ruby ran Carousel Club ads on the Weird Beard radio show. Do you know if 
if audio of them still exists. I don't think they do, but I know he, he did run them. I know that's true. That would be very cool. And yeah. then super chats, 20 pounds from John S. On balance, Unbound. I oh, believe yeah, the pains know far more than they have ever admitted. Ah! But what would motivate two privately wealthy individuals to lead double mm. lives and make such sacrifices for the CIA for the whole of their lives? Well, maybe all of their family has done that for generations. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Every <laughs> single member of their families have done that. What could it be, Eric? What could it be? It's possible. It's mm -hmm. possible. Maybe there's more than money in life. Yes. <laughs> um, Peter Cochito, super sticker, $49.99. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. But he does ask questions on locals. On he does? Website. Yes. Oh, it's he, the same guy? Okay. Yep. He's shown up on uh, Girl Streams. Okay. Michael Chambers is a new uh, member. Was, he was a new member last week. Oh, I don't know. Um, iHeartPG is a new <laughs> local subscriber. Still wants to touch your hair. The hell's going on up there? Uh, sorry, and not for a dollar ninety nine. You're not touching the hair. <laughs> uh, Gina wants to know: Did Michael purchase the lesbian I films? I, for I, I don't know the origin of the films where they came from. Uh, he denies all knowledge of the films. That's all I know. Um, so I don't know. I know she uh, was really demanding about getting them back, and they did bring them back. <laughs> I, 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 one thing I will say about Ruth Payne from everything I've seen. Mm -hmm. that's one badass woman yeah that's a tough broad i mean she i mean pretty, she's yeah. she's not a joke you know like no 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 no, no, no doing the voice and everything but she is tough as yeah. nails and yeah he even this sharp. week he said he went up there and she even in the nursing home she's sharp as a tack yeah she, dude she, she's gonna stick to her story in the coffin oh yeah yeah uh john foe three dollar super sticker thank you Michael Chambers with a five dollar super. It's the same guy. I like. Okay, I man. know. I like Mike. Dude, what about that guy with two dollars on a roll every every time last week? The same. That guy. Uh, he's not here at the moment. I or I don't know if he's here, but yeah, that that is definitely wild. And by the way, we did get a fifty dollar super chat that came in, like after the wire, and I, I forgot who it was. I apologize. I, I try to get to them, but what happens is in the background, I'm switching off different things, and so I'm going to miss them if okay. it's you know, toward the end. I just want to point out all the evidence about Oswald is in that garage. Just think about it. He's not in the garage. When she, when she leaves New Orleans with Marina to drive back across the country, uh, takes all this stuff and puts it in the garage, everything that is manufactured as evidence, created as evidence, or is real evidence, is in that garage. And that includes the Klein sporting goods application tear out, the backyard photo, the Walker photo, the blanket the rifle was wrapped in, the Minox camera. Every, anybody who wanted to frame Oswald had to control that garage. And that was controlled by Ruth and Michael Payne. Cool. Um, let's see, boner in sweatpants. Oswald was a lone gunman. I don't believe that. I just think it's funny when Mark gets upset with the lone, gun, lone gunman folks. Keep up the great work, gentlemen. Thank uh, thanks, you. Boner. Thanks, Boner. <laughs> Napoleon Boner. Napoleon Boner Pond. Crystal Pondack or Pontac is a new member. Thank you. And here's Chris Watson. Any new updates on the JFK trading cards? That we're still working it. I actually. Uh, we sent off a proof. It didn't line up quite right with the frame, so we're adjusting the frame to try to make sure they print correctly. And it, it's a little trickier because you have to have, like, the um, safe area and then the cutoff area. We're into the little niggly details, but we want them to look right. Um, Pasha, great show as always, gents. By the way, I would never resort to bad puns. Like, I'm glad this wasn't a painless episode. Don't. Nope. Nope. Never going to do it. Nope. Joan Campbell, $1.99. Thank you very much. BTK. Hey, I'm wearing a tuxedo today. I don't know if I noticed that today. I'm, I've gone with a tuxedo jacket. But... Oh, oh, this guy. Sure. This guy's here every week, too. Yes. Uh, today, military jets over and tanks, missiles, armored cars going inside cities to intimidate the opposition. Biden, Obama, Milley, Soviet, China show. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it is a shit show, I think would be the term. Um, James Holbrook, dollar ninety nine. Thank you, Michael Hepner, ten dollar super sticker. Uh, Michael comes grandson. up a lot. Yeah, Richie Hepner's grandson. Yep, yep. 
Uh, James Holbrook, 99 cents. Thank you. And Elated Kitten with a $20 super sticker. By the way, the, the, the book that look at um, that look at that cat in the picture. <laughs> the book that the book that Marina gave that uh, Ruth gave to Marina was called the Book of Useful Advice. That was the title of the book. <laughs> Stay away from Ruth. Is that the yeah. useful advice? The book of useful advice. That was the title of the book. Uh, blatant localism. Four ninety nine. Thank you. Um, this is something we'll probably cover on Friday, folks. What? Uh, Mark, does Trump have an ace up his sleeve if they convict him in revealing what he knows about the JFK assassination, nah, as he nah, said to his son I, in an interview? I don't think so. I don't. I don't think that's an ace that they're um, that's up his sleeve. But we'll talk about it on Friday. Uh, great show today. Thank you, uh, Charles Severs at the super sticker. Thank you very much, and. Bob Ruhlman, I was going to suggest you sell Ruth Payne drinking glasses, but unfortunately, nothing about her holds water. That's Thanks funny. for the great show. She <laughs> probably sue us. She probably has a trademark or something. She has her own Ruth Payne drinking glasses. I don't she know. might. She might. She's got a handler. Yeah. yeah. And we have one oh, more tip that came in. You're not drinking anything with my name on it, you boys. I, you disgust me, both of you. Hunley and Grobear. <laughs> But Don't try promise. to make a trading card with my face on it. If that's what you're thinking. I'm oh, on too, to both of you. Too late. Too late. Uh, great I want a piece of the action, Hunley. <laughs> great episode. I noticed that a lot. Uh, I can't read that. A lot. Uh, Alon I S T all. I. I'm sorry. There was like. The, the typing's very weird for Victory 04. I, I, I have so many super chats. I don't know what to do anymore. No, I just can't read it. It's, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the sentence says. I can't even read them anymore. I'm so, I'm so old. Yeah, well, that might be it. And let's see, somebody's saying, can we do an episode on the Payne's Handlers? Well, we don't know the guy. It's just a guy yeah. that, that uh, Max mentioned. He's in the background. Oh, he's on film. He's in the film. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody he's should the, check out that film, by the way. He's in the film. He's got the boxes. And that's the um, Assassination of Mrs. Payne. That's Max's film. Right, right. Good film. Really good. Great, great film. Great film. Good show from Greg Capella. Thank you. Or Capella. And on that note, Oswald has to make his appearance. What the hell's going on, Hunley, with that dog? You know, well, not it, every dog has his day. Well, this one has his day. As a matter of fact, somebody sent me a picture of their Oswald from uh, uh, the balcony of their Hawaiian condominium. What? That's right. So Oswald is in Hawaii. He's all having over the a world. good time. That's the right. We've, we've, we have Oswald and the grow bear in Tasmania. So literally on the other side of the world. What the hell's going Oh, that's the bear. That terrifies me. That's the grow bear. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> And folks, if you do want merch, you can always grab it. Um, there's links below in the description that will take you there. Mm -hmm. Unstructure.locals.com is our locals. We've mentioned it multiple times. There are letters from Ruth Payne there. Uh, Mark, hopefully you post up that Green Valley stuff later on. Oh, yeah, I will. I will. I definitely I'm still reading it. I, I'm still, I'm doing, I'm going up there. I'm well, gonna, it's new to me. This is completely. Yeah. I, I, Completely yeah, it, it, it's new to me too. I just got it last night from Max, so I'm real. I, I stayed up all night reading all their manifesto and stuff. We got. I'm going to go up there. Nice. Bring my dog also. Star is my boxer. All right, and folks, you can follow us for free on Locals. It, it, you don't have to pay to follow. Look around, see if you like it. There are things that you have to be a paid member to, you know, view or to get. But things like this show is streaming on there right now. What about the sub? How many subs do we have? Well, um, our YouTube subs, we are at 85,000. What? Oh, by the way, RFK on Rumble tonight uh, for the first time after being uh, cock blocked off of YouTube. He, uh, I heard, uh, um, wasn't Dan Bongino today talking about him, who's apparently part owner of Rumble, mm -hmm. uh, talking about he's going solo tonight, seven o'clock Eastern, uh, which is about now, I guess, on Rumble. Um, so I'm going to look at that afterwards, not live, but maybe a little later. Okay. Well, but I mean, they're pulling down everything that he, they took down the Jordan Peterson, Peterson one. 
I mean, it was over on Twitter, and they took down the Mike Tyson one with Theo. Um, well, the two things, Theo Vaughn's and Mike Tyson's, two different interviews. It's funny because he said in the interview with Rogan that uh, Theo Vaughn called him quite shaken up about this and, and, and can't have him on the show because he's afraid of losing his entire livelihood now. Theo Vaughn, that is. And uh, he apparently lives in Hollywood, and he mm. goes over to his studio. Um, and now he's completely shaken up. Uh, Theo Vaughn over this uh, RFK thing. That's sad. It is yeah, sad. I mean, it really was sad. He he wants to have him on, but he's afraid. Wow. He's afraid. Yeah, they, it's real, my friends. It's real. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, it, it's easy to mock somebody is like it, Theo, right. but, you know, right now it'd be devastating to me. This is my job. Right. I mean, so I can totally, totally understand it. Mm -hmm. Linda Walker coming in hot at the end. Charming okay. dramatization. Yeah, th uh, right. This is the last call, folks. If you have any stupid chats, yeah, like I said in New York, you can order 20 drinks at 359 and sit there all night with the 20 drinks. But that's it. That's last call. That's where it comes from. They lock the door. <laughs> you sit there with your 20 gin and tonics at 4 a.m. and nobody bothers you. You can order 20 bottles of beer at 359 a.m. Uh, this is last call. on. Don't cry to Hunley. Because you didn't get it in at last call, you 1,490 commenters. If you have any <laughs> money or any super chat desire, I, I, I don't care what you do personally, but now is when you have to put up or shut up because uh, Hunley's going to close the door of justice and you're not going to be able to get anything <laughs> in. And he's going to call me in about an hour going, I can't believe somebody donated $150 with a question on super chat. I feel so guilty. Now is last call. Last call for alcohol or whatever, <laughs> Bud Light or whatever you got drinking over there. Uh, you got a super chat, pull it out of your ass. Let's go. <laughs> or it could be a super thanks later. And we or love super those. Thanks. those uh, you can do a super thanks in the comment yep. section. But YouTube kind of sniffs those out. Who knows what piece they take out of that? Well, they take a piece out of the super chats. They take a piece out of everything. So they it take is a what piece it is. Out of, take a piece out of this dog. That's uh, that's not going to happen with this with star on it. That's for sure. You know, like, it's really funny because, <laughs> oh, here it is. Last call, Dan Hack. Yeah, he took a $2 dump. Thank you, Dan Hack. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> right, How can you that. laugh? You know, it's so funny because a couple of times we get a quote, a comment from someone. How could you laugh at the assassination of the president? You two are despicable. How could you laugh at such a tragic, well, time plus tragedy equals comedy, Eric? Um, yes, absolutely. And there is one more tip that came in. Rogue Thunder sent a tip on locals. Yiddish word of the day, shmata. Shmata is clothing. Yeah, it says clothing. But I, I said bubamices are actually in the show. Oh, I saw. I, I, you said that actually, a lot. Yeah. Well, it's, it's in I, my, I, I looked it, it up. It's a grandmother's tale. I think it's when I looked it up or something. It, it's bullshit. Yeah, it means bullshit. It just means bullshit. Um, Miss, this is Council Miss of Shmata. Nine, psych Miss channeling. Shmata. Oh, wow. Dude, I, I want to find out about uh, Arthur Young's uh, seances. Um, for sure. I, I'm not doing come on, Bobby, every week just to for two bucks, BTK. Look, I got to stretch it out. They got glasses they're selling. <laughs> oh, I, I, I'm getting hocked to make this cameo thing, Eric, to do uh, whatever cameo is. So maybe if I set up this cameo thing, we could do all these slogans on cameo for people. Whatever the hell cameo is. Like 20. Oh, people you're doing have, cameo? The 20 people have asked me to do cameos already. I don't even know what it is. Oh, they my God. To, you're a celebrity. What they want me to do these things like come on Bobby, so I'm not going to do them for free here. If I could build an empire, <laughs> oh my God. if I could build an empire on cameo, whatever cameo is, and I'm not, oh God, because I don't know what it is. But 20 different people have said, Hey, dude, you got to go on cameo, do these uh, things on cameo. So okay. we're going we're gonna to look at it on Friday. Uh, okay. Yeah, where is that bill? Let me see. Uh, yeah, know. where is your I don't silly know. bill? I don't know. I, uh, I don't know what happened to it, but oh, here it is. I just found it. Okay, you ready? There's the bill. Nope. Gonna... It's simply Austin back and to the left. Okay, there's people. Obviously, last call for alcohol <laughs> and, and super chat. <laughs> the last call. We do appreciate it. We, no, no, we're no, we're playing games, me? but this, this helps keep us alive. It, it, it helps a ton if you, you know, try out the sponsors get products, things like that. It, this all really does help. Well, look, I'm, just tell I'm a friend. You don't have to give money. You could tell a friend and that helps a lot. Right. That's a good point. That's a good point. 
I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of information we're putting out here and a lot of books I got to read to get there. And it's um, all fun and games until somebody goes blind. Then that's not so funny anymore. You know what I mean? Like people go blind from reading too much on them. There's no telethon for that. That's true. And on that note, we will see everybody for free. Wait, Friday. That's it. That's it. Okay, good. That was a good show. I think so. All right. See thank you all you. Friday. Okay. Bye. Bye.